In the last episode, we saw the engine bay looking like this after the ice motor was taken out and cleaned up a bit. Um, but we wanted to paint it uh, before the components went into their final mounting spots. So with the magic of video, we went from this to this to this. Going back, here's a shot of the ride height we achieved before the conversion with the cut springs. We removed over 700 pounds from the front with the cast iron motor and only added about 500 pounds back with the batteries and the accessories. In the rear, we removed about 200 pounds of fuel, fuel tank, and rear differential, but we added about 600 pounds of the batteries and drive unit. Not only do the weights differ from stock, the weight between the left and the right and the rear are also uneven because the Tesla drive unit has a heavy motor on the driver's side and a light inverter on the passenger side. In order to get an even ride height and compensate for the weight changes, we decided a fully adjustable suspension was the way to go. Here's a couple shots of the front and the rear suspension. I forgot to take photos of the wheel gap with the stock suspension and no weight in the front, but it was pretty close to this. Now with the adjustable suspension, even with no weight, we can get a pretty good stance. The drive unit controller uses 12 volt signals to command the state between neutral, drive, and reverse. Many EV conversions will use a toggle switch to achieve 12 volt signal commands, but we wanted to keep the interior controls as stock as possible, so that meant using the stock shifter. We used the stock neutral safety switch controlled by the shifter arm to give us the 12 volt signals we needed. Originally, the switch would provide 12 volt in park or neutral to let the starter motor circuit operate because an ice motor can only start when the transmission is disengaged. That gave us 12 volts for park and neutral. The switch would also trigger reverse lights to come on when the reverse was selected. This gave us 12 volts for reverse. In the original setup, selecting drive gave no voltage to any output because you don't want the starter to turn while in drive and you don't want the reverse lights on while in drive. We were able to use a 5-pin relay and two diodes to create a negative triggered circuit. The absence of 12 volts would turn off the relay and allow current to flow through the normally open output, giving 12 volts to the drive input on the drive unit. The neutral safety switch no longer had a transmission mount to mount to and couldn't be mounted in the original position due to the battery in the transmission tunnel. So we fabricated a new mount and cut down the linkage from the shifter uh, to the switch but kept the adjustment threads for fine tuning. We wanted to keep the instrument cluster analog. To the right there's an ammeter connected to a shunt to measure the amp draw. In the center there's a GPS speedometer. The gauge cluster on the left is original. We were able to use the stock coolant sensor in line with the drive unit cooling system so the stock temperature gauge will tell us the drive unit temperature. The battery management system has an output that translates the state of charge to a signal used by a standard fuel gauge. With the proper calibration, the fuel gauge now reads the state of charge empty to full. The warning lights for the seat belts, parking brake, and brake wear remain intact. The glow plug light is now repurposed as a pre-charge signal indicator coming on when the pre-charge is operating. The battery light is now hooked up to the charge controller and indicates when a charge cycle is in process. EV conversions have contactor controls. There's a negative and positive contactor that allow current flow from the batteries to the drive unit. As we talked about previously, there's also a pre-charge relay to prevent current and rush into the drive unit capacitors. These components should be housed in a weatherproof case because water and dirt can be conductive and dangerous. Normally there will be a contactor box just for the high voltage contactors, but I got ambitious and decided to house my 12 volt systems in the same box as well. I mounted all the components to an aluminum plate and then bolted the plate inside the weatherproof box to make install wiring easier. I divided the box using a non-conductive plastic divider for good measure. I needed to get 12 volt direct from the battery, 12 volt ground to the chassis, and 12 volt from the ignition key on into the box. I used these three pass-through studs as a tidy way to get those connections into the box. All the 12 volt connections needed to be fused for safety before going to the components or relays. I harvested and modified a fuse panel and a relay panel from a junk sprinter van which gave plenty of fuses and relays for controls.
to get the BMS signals, fuel gauge output, can wiring, and all the other low current signals, I use a 31 pin connector. For all the higher current 12 volt signals such as cooling fan power and coolant pump power, I used a 6 pin connector. To get the high voltage lines into the box, I used 4 cable gland connectors. Before building the box, I made a comprehensive chart of all the connections needed. That told me how many fuses I would need, how many relays I would need, and which connection would go into which pin on outgoing connectors. On the 12 volt side, you could see the relays to control the fans, pumps, pre-charge, and BMS status loop. The two circuit boards are BMSs, one for each battery pack. The EVCC charge controller is mounted to the divider board. On the high voltage side, you could see the positive contactor, negative contactor, shunt, main fuse, pre-charge resistor, and two fuses for the DC to DC converter and the charger. Once the assembly was fully wired and mounted into the box, I used aluminum angle to mount the box to the bottom of the battery box under the hood. There was just enough space to be able to open the lid to the box to make the final connections and program the battery management system and the charge controller. As mentioned before, the battery and drive unit have two independent cooling systems to maintain their temperatures. In order to move coolant through each system, we used electric coolant pumps. The coolant pump for the batteries is the stock Chevy Volt pump we pulled off the donor car. The coolant pump for the drive unit we pulled off a junk Sprinter van. If this model 300D were one year newer, it would have come with an electric coolant pump, which must have been a good design because the 2004 Sprinter pump looks identical to the 1981 300D one. Also from the Chevy Volt donor car is the T air separator that attaches the reservoir to the cooling system. Each radiator has its own cooling fan. In order to maintain the optimal temperature, there is a fan switch to kick on and off each fan. Each radiator had 10 AN fittings. We built a manifold off each radiator adapted to those fittings uh, that contain the fan switch and for the driving aside, the stock temperature sensor to send the signal to the stock temperature gauge. That's it for this episode. Tune in next time for the final install.